Our speaker today is Yunon Spinker, and he's going to tell us about amenability via stochastic domination and finitary codings. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I was supposed to uh, attend the conference and uh, last minute something came up and I, I, I couldn't make it, uh, which is unfortunate, uh, but I'm happy to have the opportunity to speak here online. Okay, so uh, so this is joint work with uh, Gora Bray, who's at uh, University of Victoria. I'm, I'm currently at UBC in Vancouver. And so what I'd like to tell you about is uh, a bit of, so, so this, this has a long history on um, these types of questions. Basically, uh, what we'd like to do is understand uh, the geometry of a space uh, through some type of probabilistic lens. Uh, so this has a very long history and, and, and recent, uh, I, I'd say a few decades, um, there's been a lot of, uh, of uh, interest in this. And this goes back, I, I would, I guess, uh, the first result of this type is probably due to Keston in the late 50s, who, who looked at random walks. <clears throat> and there's uh, a lot of works about percolation and the easing model, hardcore model, uh, spanning trees, and, and, and other types of models. And, and there's a short list of names here, but there's many more work on these types of things. Um, my focus today is going to be on uh, percolation and the easing model. Uh, so the types of space we're going to be talking about are our graphs. Uh, in this talk, I'll just uh, restrict myself to transitive graphs, uh, which are connected and locally finite. Uh, however, everything I say um, works for quasi-transitive graphs, definitely. And, and pretty much, and most of what I say is also, also, also works in the generality of uh, bounded degree graphs, uh, but, but we'll just fix, just think about transitive graphs just to make our life easier for now. Uh, so a graph is a, a transitive graph is amenable if and only if it's Cheeger constant is zero. And here, um, I don't think it's going to be too important for us exactly um, the, the exact definition of the Cheeger constant. So this could be either the vertex Cheeger constant or the edge Cheeger constant. When it comes up, if, if I if I need it, I'll I'll say which one I'm referring to. Uh, so, so this boundary here could either be the vertex boundary or the edge boundary, uh, but, but it leads to the same definition of amenability for, for uh, bounded degree graphs. Okay, so this is, uh, so, so, so the type of probabilistic uh, things that we're going to be looking at, so the two probabilistic notions which appear in the title are stochastic domination and finitary codings. Uh, I'll introduce them both. Uh, the first, let's say, uh, half of the talk, or maybe slightly less, will be stochastic domination, uh, and then we'll talk about finitary codings, and and uh, the last part I'll, I'll I'll discuss a bit about the proof uh, ideas. So, um, so those are the two uh, probabilistic notions, and then there's two models that, uh, as I said earlier, what we're going to talk about here. Um, so for each of these probabilistic notions, we'll consider. Uh, percolation and the easing model. And uh, when we talk about geometry, uh, the thing I'm going to be interested in today is amenability versus non-amenability. So basically this leads to kind of eight different um, categories. So for each of the probabilistic notions, you can consider each of the models and, and, and each of the situations of the geometry. And, and in each of these, there's gonna be some, some results. Uh, so as I said, we'll start with stochastic domination and talk about all the results in these four cases and then move on to finitary codings. Okay, so um, stochastic domination is, is a very a very basic tool in, in probability and very useful. Um, this can be defined in, in a very general context. Uh, I guess the most basic context is for real valued random variables. And then you can look at um, more general uh, partially ordered spaces. And the one that uh, will be relevant for today's talk is zero one to the V, where V is the vertex set of the graph. Uh, so V here is a countable set, either finite or countable. And if we have two random variables there, X stochastically dominates Y, um, there's a few equivalent definitions. Um, so if the probability of any increasing event is larger for X than, than it is for Y, or the expectation of an increasing uh, bounded function. And the third, um, the third definition, which is the one I'm going to really work with today, is that there's a coupling of the two random variables. So you can, you can 
uh, realize them on the same, on a common probability space in such a way that almost surely uh, with probability one, X is greater or equal than Y in the partial order. Uh, maybe, maybe I should say if that this isn't clear, the partial order in zero one to the V is the pointwise partial order. So X is greater or equal than Y for specific realization if for every vertex, the value is greater or equal. Okay, so we can realize them on a common probability space so that almost surely this uh, partial order uh, holds. Okay, so the very, the, the simplest and, and most basic example, uh, which, which, which I guess, I, I guess really um, was all, already came up in, in, uh, in Tom's talk, although I don't, I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, stochastic domination was one of the specific things that were talked about. If we look at IID fields, so uh, every vertex is zero or one with probability P independently between the vertices, then uh, one of these fields uh, stochastically dominates the other if and only if P is larger or equal than P prime. And there's two couplings that can realize this. So one coupling, if we just take a specific P and P prime, we can just couple them independently at different vertices according to these probabilities. So the pair is one, one with probability P prime, one, zero with prob probability P minus P prime and zero, zero with probability one minus P. And it's easy to check that the marginals are exactly IIDP and IIDP prime. And, and this exhibits a coupling uh, such that almost surely um, XP is greater or equal than XP prime. And then there's also the, 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 the universal uh, monotone coupling where you, you take uniform uh, zero one variables and, and basically you can couple all of the XPs simultaneously on the same space um, in, in such a way that you have this, um, this monotonicity. So these are two, two hopefully very um, simple examples. Okay, so the main question that we're going to look at is if given some random field uh, and we'll in a moment be talking about, as I said, percolation and easing in the easing model. And given some parameter P, uh, we'd like to ask, does this um, random field X stochastically dominate an IAD process uh, of density P? And we can talk about the optimal value of P for which this holds. So the super over overall P such that X uh, dominates an IAD of density P. Okay, so this, uh, this uh, Px is going to be a recurring uh, quantity in, in at least this first half of the talk. Okay, so this is the optimal density of an IID process that, that, our, um, our, that the, the, the random uh, field that we're looking at dominates. Okay, now sometimes uh, I'll sometimes interchange the uh, random variable X with its, with its law, with its distribution, and, 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 and I mean the same thing. Okay, so let's start with percolation. So this is uh, just IID Bernoulli percolation. Okay, so we have omega. I'm, I'm going to look at site percolation just to have everything uh, in this talk be uh, um, living on the vertices of the graph. So uh, these are independent random variables of parameter. Let's take, let's take P prime just so we don't have a clash with this uh, P uh, here. Okay, so, so now there's kind of two IID processes in, in our uh, in, in this world, but I'm gonna call one of them IID and one of them Bernoulli, even though they're, they're the same thing, just to distinguish between the Bernoulli percolation, which I think of as a percolation process, and another process which I just think of as an IID process, and I'm not thinking about its per percolation properties. Okay, so omega is our site percolation. And now we're gonna look at the infinite clusters, which is this uh, random field, which will denote as by omega infinity which is simply the, the field consisting at every vertex, a zero or a one, according to whether that vertex is in an infinite cluster of this uh, underlying Bernoulli percolation. So another way to think about that is we take the Bernoulli percolation omega and we just delete all of the finite clusters. Okay, so uh, to begin with every site is open or closed with probability P prime independently, but then everything that happens to be open, but in a finite cluster, we, we simply make it closed and that gives us omega infinity. Okay, so only the infinite clusters are, are left open. Okay, so this is no longer an IID field. 
Okay, so what can we what can we say about this? Well, clearly, um, omega infinity doesn't dominate any IID field if p prime is less than pc, because if p prime is less than pc, there are no infinite clusters, and so omega infinity is just almost surely all zero. Okay, so that that's obvious. But then um, the the other side of this uh, is is the um, natural question of whether once there is percolation, once we're above PC and, and we have an infinite cluster, uh, does that infinite cluster or the, the set of sites which are already in infinite cluster, does that field stochastically dominate some IID process? Okay, so if, is P of omega infinity positive? And, uh, and we might also ask this, uh, even when P prime is close to one, even that there it's not, not a priori clear what, what happens. Okay, so let's try to figure this out. Um, let, let me give two examples just to get us into the um, into this. So let's start with the z squared. Okay, so in z squared, let's suppose that omega infinity. So z squared has a non-trivial um, um, phase transition for for bond percolation. It's exactly at a half. We're thinking about site percolation, so the, the exact value. Is not a half, but but it's not not so important for us. If p prime is is greater than that pc, there is an infinite cluster. So this omega infinity is is non-trivial, and and we might hope that it stochastically dominates some IID process of parameter p. Okay, so let's assume that happens. We can take an n by n box, and uh, let's look at the event that omega infinity on the entire box is zero. In other words, that none of the vertices in that box are in an infinite cluster in the under underlying Bernoulli percolation. Well, on the one hand, that probability is at least one minus P prime to the four N because if all of the sites on the boundary of the box happen to have been closed in the underlying percolation, which has exactly this probability, then of course, none of the vertices inside the box can be connected to infinity. Whether they're open or not, they're definitely not in infinite clusters. Okay, so this event has at least this probability. On the other hand, because we're assuming that uh, we stochastically dominate I an IID process and the event of, of being all zeros in decreasing event, this probability is at most one minus P to the N squared. Okay, um, if omega infinity is is large, it stochastically dominates an IID process, then increasing events have larger probability. So decreasing events like this have smaller probability. Okay, so that gives us an upper bound. And from here, we get an upper bound on P. So P is at most uh, this number here, but this is true for all values of N. So P must be zero. Okay, so here we see that on Z squared, whatever the value of P prime, which was the probability of the underlying Bernoulli percolation, even if it's close to one, um, the infinite clusters don't dominate an IID process of any density. Okay, on the other hand, let's take uh, another example, the three regular tree. Uh, and here, um, one idea that we can try to, to do is, so let's call X the, uh, the, this process of, infinite, of the infinite cluster. Let's let Y be uh, the restriction of X to the past of a vertex, okay, so we fix a vertex V, we fix one direction, whatever direction, let's call that the past of V, and let's condition on the past and ask what is the probability that that vertex um, is one. In other words, given the past, but not given the, the percolation in the past, only given the information of for every vertex in the past, is it in an infinite cluster or not? That's our process Y. What is the probability that V is in an infinite cluster? Okay, so this is some uh, measurable function of the conditioning of the past Y. And uh, it's not hard to, to, to analyze this or at least get lower bounds. So if it happens to be that X U is one, uh, this is part of the conditioning and U is, U is the vertex, in, uh, the adjacent vertex to V in the past. If that vertex happens to be in an infinite cluster, then if V itself is open in the underlying Bernoulli percolation, it's also in an infinite cluster. So, um, so, so, so the probability is at least P prime, basically it's equal to P prime. 
Now, if the vertex U is not in an infinite cluster, if that happens to be what we're conditioning on, then it's not hard to convince uh, yourself that even given that conditioning, there's still, it, it's, it's always possible to close um, sites which are not in infinite clusters because either they were close to begin with or they were in a finite cluster and you can still close it without affecting the conditioning. So even given uh, all this information in the past, the probability that the vertex U is, is actually closed, not only is it in a finite cluster, but sorry, not only is it not in an infinite cluster, but it's actually a closed site, uh, that's, that has a lower bounded probability. And once that occurs, if we condition on that, then basically this, the future here, all the percolation here at the bottom, given this conditioning is actually independent of everything else. And it's actually exactly Bernoulli percolation with the same underlying parameter P prime. So now we have a, a binary tree and um, the, the critical threshold for binary tree and the three regular tree are the same. And so we have a lower bound on the probability um, that, that V is in an infinite cluster going downwards. Okay, and, and this is uh, this is theta, the, the probability of the, the root of a binary tree is in an infinite cluster. Okay, so either way, whatever the conditioning is, there's a lower bound um, that holds uniformly. Um, and therefore we can couple sequentially, you, you just start at a vertex of the tree and then you, you just kind of go in by BFS order one by one. And at every point, um, whatever happened, you can imagine that's the past of that vertex. And you know that whatever happened, what we just said is that no matter what happened conditionally on that, there's still lower bounded probability um, that uh, the vertex you're looking at is in an infinite cluster. Okay, so we get a, um, that, that the P of omega infinity is positive once we're above uh, the critical point. Okay, so this, this shows a, a very, um, a, a very uh, sharp difference between at least z squared and the tree. And, and really what's happening here is the issue of amenability versus non-amenability. Okay, so, so here's, here's the theorem. If d is amenable, uh, then P of omega infinity is zero for all of the values of the percolation. This is basically the exact same proof we gave for z squared. I just replace boxes by, by sets which, um, which, uh, which realize the infimum in the definition of amenability. So, so this is an easy part, uh, but the main content of the theorem is that when G is non-amenable, um, that uh, P omega infinity actually tends to one as P prime tends to one. And this is interesting, even in the case of the tree, because if we go back and look at uh, the proof here, um, while we were able to show that uh, P omega infinity is positive, actually the, the way that we, we made that the proof went, uh, the lower bound gets worse and worse as P prime goes to one, which is not what you would expect. And the theorem is actually telling you that that, that actually isn't the case. And, and actually P of omega infinity does go to one, but even, in, even on a tree, you have to, um, you, there, there's something to do. Okay, so, so this is, um, this you can kind of see as a characterization of, of amenability. Okay, um, basically there's a very sharp uh, difference between amenable and non-amenable graphs in terms of the stochastic domination properties of the infinite clusters of Bernoulli percolation. Okay, and uh, I don't think I will focus uh, during this talk, I, I, I'm not gonna pretty much speak at all about invariant, um, invariant domination, but I just do wanna remark that, that this is um, another thing that one can look at. So one can ask whether, um, for example, for omega infinity, whether not only does it dominate a Bernoulli percolation, but does it, is there an, uh, an invariant monotone coupling? Um, so you wanna dominate the, the IID, but in such a way that the joint uh, distribution is invariant. And, and again, even in the case of the tree, if you go back and think about how this proof worked, because it's a sequential coupling, it doesn't give you a, an, invariant, uh, an invariant coupling at the end. So even on the tree, again, um, getting an invariant coupling is something that's, that, that, that one needs to think about how to do. 
Okay, so so this theorem really does also give you an invariant coupling in the in the non-amenable case. Okay, so that's that's percolation. Let's move on to talk about the easing model. So we, we already saw the easing model today. Uh, just a quick reminder: we have an inverse temperature beta, um, and we uh, we want to sample a spin configuration sigma of pluses of mi and minuses on the vertices of the graph. If the graph is finite, then we can do this simply by assigning a weight to each configuration. Uh, so the weight is e to the power of beta times the, the sum of nearest neighbors of sigma u sigma v. So this favors nearest neighbors having the same spin value. And this defines a probability measure. And for infinite graphs, we can obtain there, we can get all sorts of weak limits, but there's two very canonical weak limits, which are the ones you obtain with all plus and all minus boundary conditions. And I'll call this the plus state and minus state. And, and I'll write this as mu plus and mu minus. Okay, so these are two extreme Gibbs states, the, the most plus e Gibbs state and the most minus e Gibbs state in some sense. And these, there's a re regime where these coincide and there's a regime where these differ. And on every graph, there's a critical beta um, under below which these are equal and above which they're different. Um, there are some graphs where this beta C is, is infinite. Um, we're not going to worry about those uh, today so much. Uh, but uh, but on most uh, nice graphs, beta C is a, a non one dimensional graphs in some sense, uh, beta C is finite. Um, and, you, and you get a picture like this, for example, on Z squared. So when, when beta is less than beta C, mu plus and mu minus are equal. There isn't, so there isn't actually a measure which has more pluses or more minuses. That it's, there's just one measure and it's 50-50 and it's kind of um, uh, disordered in this, in this fashion. There's a critical point where a lot of interesting behavior occurs. And in this talk, we're just gonna focus on the low temperature regime, so high beta, uh, where we have these two different Gibbs states, one which is mostly plus and one which is mostly minus. And then uh, a natural question here to ask is when beta is very large, uh, so in this picture on the right, if we look at the plus state, is it the case that, the, that, that that measure, that the pluses of that measure stochastically dominate an IID process of high density? So that, that's a way to measure how, to say that there are indeed a lot of pluses in some sense. Okay. And, and here, here's the theorem in that case. So if you look at P of mu plus, again, this is the optimal density of an IID process that, that mu plus dominates. Uh, we again have this um, um, sharp dichotomy. So in the amenable, in any amenable graph, even Z squared, so like Z squared, so even, even in this picture here, even though it looks like there's a lot of pluses and there, there are in some sense, there aren't in the sense of stochastic domination. So actually as beta goes to infinity, the, the best IID process that, that you dominate, um, its density goes to zero actually, whereas on a non-amenable graph, it goes to one. So the 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 the, case, the amenable case again is not uh, is not too difficult. Um, it's it, it, it's similar types of ideas um, to what we uh, discussed earlier for the percolation. Um, but the non-amenable case is really the one that's uh, that that's of interest here, and that that's a question that was raised by Liggett and Steiff, um, and they studied uh, ZD in the amenable case and regular trees in the non-amenable case. So so. So for regular trees, uh, this was known, and for regular trees, you can actually compute the exact values, and 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 so so you can you can kind of really understand this function. Um, but but that that was by exact computations, and then uh, again, I'll just mention that this uh, this is also true for invariant domination, uh, in the non-amenable case, and and that's new even for trees, uh, and and even for trees actually. Um, we still have, there's still some nice open questions, which I'll, I'll, I'll get to later. So basically for every, each of these theorems that I'm, I'm stating, there, there are some open questions still. Okay. And uh, one other thing that I'd like to mention is, um, 
is also that um, a comparison theorem between two different easing measures. So, so far I, I, I was only talking about comparing some easing, the easing measure, the, the plus state to an IID process. Now I'm gonna take two easing measures of different, at different temperatures at different parameters beta and ask whether we can compare those two. Okay, so going back to this picture again, as we increase beta, in some sense, the measure becomes more and more plusy. There's more and more pluses. But we wanna ask, is that true in the sense of stochastic domination? And again, as it turns out, there's, there's again, this uh, big difference between amenable and non-amenable uh, graphs. On amenable graphs, actually these measures aren't stochastically comparable. Uh, whereas on non-amenable graphs, at, at least at, at, at sufficiently low temperature, so high values of beta, these do actually increase stochastically. So as you increase beta, these measures increase stochastically. Uh, and that again um, answers uh, another question of Ligit and Steiff in that same paper where they also studied these questions on ZD and, and trees. Okay, so, uh, so that's, uh, those are the stochastic uh, domination uh, uh, results I, I want to tell you about. So the second, the second part of the talk is going to be about finitary coatings. So let me first tell you what this is. Um, maybe before I say exactly what it is, this is a, it's a notion that it's kind of on the border of probability, um, ergodic theory, which is in some sense the origins of this, uh, but this also has uh, relations to computer science and, and algorithm, like distributed algorithms and things like that. So I, I think it's a, it's an interesting topic. Uh, so here uh, the setting is is we have two invariant processes. Um, I'm just going to imagine that they're zero one valued. I guess even though the example here is. Uh, Maybe, maybe take some other values. And what we're trying to do is write one of, the, one of these uh, processes as a function of the other. Okay, so we're trying to encode one of the, one of the processes uh, using, another, using the other process. Okay, and, and uh, so, so I'll use the term coding and factor interchangeably. These are the same thing. So we say that Y is a factor of X. If we can write Y, as a measurable function of x, so y is, is phi of x for some measurable function phi, which uh, is equivariant. So it commutes with translations. Uh, that's in the case of, of, uh, of ZD and in the case of, uh, of, a, of a general tra uh, transitive graph, it commutes with the automorphisms of the graph. Okay, so that means it behaves nicely with respect to the, the invariance of the graph. Okay, and we say that a factor like that is finitary if, if this measurability uh, requirement can be upgraded to something um, more, um, more concrete in a sense, more algorithmic. And what this means is that we can compute, if we, if we look at the value of y at some vertex v0, let's say this vertex here in the center, then it's actually determined by the values of x on some large finite, um, ball, but not, but not a ball whose radius is determined ahead of time, but whose radius is, is, is random and depends on the input. Basically, it's a stopping time where you, you see more and more of the input, and you, you, you can imagine that there's an algorithm that at every step, it kind of, uh, it, it, uh, it takes a look at the input, and it decides whether the output is already determined or not. And to be finitary means that you're guaranteed that at some point, almost surely at some point, there some finite point in time, the algorithm will stop and, and output the, the, the value. Okay, so it depends on a finite but random radius. Okay, so at every vertex, there is, there's some finite radius, but when you look at a different vertex, it might be a different radius, although it's the same, uh, in law it's the same, because it's the same algorithm at every point because this phi was equivariant. Okay, so you can imagine that there's an algorithm and the same algorithm is applied at every vertex and it's applied to the input um, or seen around that vertex. So the, question, the basic question here is given a, um, a process Y, 
uh, can we write Y as a factor of an IID process? So can we choose X to be some IID process and choose Phi to be some, um, some clever map which exactly takes these IID variables and outputs a, a, a field with the exact distribution that we're, we're or the exact target distribution that we care about. Okay, so if it's just a factor, we'll call it, we'll say it's an FIID, factor of ID. And if it has this finite area property, we will say FFIID, so finite area factor of ID. And we're gonna be looking at mostly finite area factors today. Uh, but let me give you an example. Uh, so consider uh, Bernoulli site, per okay, Bonder site percolation here, it's not so important. Okay, so we start with Omega, which is a, a, a site or bound, bond percolation. And then we construct a process Y by taking every cluster of the Bernoulli percolation and independently coloring it plus or minus with probability half half. Okay, so Y now is a plus minus value uh, random field. And we can ask ourselves, is that, is that field a finite area factor of ID? Is it a factor of ID and, and hence so on? So if there's no infinite cluster in the underlying Bernoulli percolation, if all the clusters are finite, then it's not hard to convince yourself that this is a finite area factor of ID because you can just describe the algorithm very easily. You, uh, your, your IID process now is the omega, which is IID, together with an additional IID process, which is going to use to, to do the coloring. And what you do, the algorithm just um, starts to reveal the Bernoulli percolation until at some point it sees that the cluster is finite and it knows what the cluster is because we're assuming that there's no infinite cluster for the moment. And once it knows what the, that the cluster is finite, it can choose one of the vertices there at random using, this, uh, using the additional IID random misc C and using that, it can decide what color to color the entire cluster. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you guys think about that if you haven't seen this before. Uh, but basically the finiteness is here is what makes it a finite area factor. And, and it, it's kind of, hopefully that's a, there's a natural connection there, but we'll see that some, some, sometimes these things aren't um, as easy as they seem. Okay, on the other hand, if there's a unique infinite cluster in the Bernoulli percolation, then this, uh, this process, this colored process is not even a factor of IID because actually it's not ergodic. Because if there's a unique infinite cluster, then this process is either going to have a more density of pluses or more density of minuses. Like, that is almost surely there's going to be more pluses or more minuses in, 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 the, sen in the sense of density. And that means it's not ergodic. So, so that rules out being a factor of IID. And then there's this uh, last case where there's infinitely many infinite clusters. And this is a, a, a very non-trivial question. Um, and there's been works of, uh, of, uh, of Sly and others recently um, um, looking at the case of, uh, of the questions of factors of IID here. Uh, but as I said, we're going to talk today about finite area factors, which is a stronger notion. Um, okay, so second, a second part of this example, let's, uh, let's construct another colored process, Z, in a very similar way, we'll color clusters independently plus or minus, but we'll only do that for finite clusters. And any infinite cluster will just deterministically set the, the, the value there to be plus. Okay, so this thing is actually always a factor of ID. Um, basically this description is all, almost immediately a, a description of, as a factor of ID. But the description itself is definitely not a description as a finite area factor of ID because in order to know that a vertex is in an infinite cluster, the only way to determine that is to look at the infinite thing. No matter like an algorithm that looks at larger and larger uh, pieces of the input is never going to know for certain that it's in an infinite cluster because perhaps it's in a large finite cluster. Even though, even if that has very small probability, um, you can't rule that out and, and therefore the algorithm has to look at everything. But that only means that the description, the, the natural description is not the description of a finite area factor of ID. But one may still ask, maybe there's a more sophisticated description which can construct this exact same process in some other way, in some other clever way as a finite area factor of ID. And that question is, is, 
and, and the answer again is, is it, that it depends. Okay, so it might be and it might not be. Okay, and so here's the, the theorem. So take, uh, so these, take either this omega infinity or this z, which are very closely related because right, we, we're, we're putting pluses on all the infinite clusters. So on omega infinity, we're making it plus. Uh, everywhere else, we're, we're, we're tossing a random coin. So, so these processes are basically very, very closely related. So for either of these, if the graph is amenable, um, it's not a finite error factor of IAD. Whatever the value of P prime is, as long as there are infinite clusters. Uh, but if the graph is non amenable, um, it is a finite error factor of ID, at least when P prime is close to one. And with the small, um, well, okay, you, small or large, depending on your viewpoint, but with the caveat that um, uh, this graph, we either need, need it to be infinitely ended, or if it's one ended, then uh, we need this. Um, this assumption that P is less than one, which which is is, is basically a, um, a well known open uh, conjecture, which I which I think Tom uh, mentioned, or will mention if he hasn't gotten there. Okay, so so again, this this again gives a a, um, a dichotomy between amenability and non amenability, and again, I I want to stress this point that the the obvious description of these processes as functions of, of the underlying Bernoulli percolation are definitely not descriptions which are finite um, But what the theorem is saying is that there's another way to, to, to construct those processes um, and describe them as finite functions of, of IAD variables. Okay, um, so before we finish with the finite factors, let's just uh, go back to the easing model. There, we also have a result there. Uh, so uh, again, we have the plus and minus states. We have the inverse temperature. So for amenable graphs, a um, uh, result that goes back to Vandenberg and Steiff uh, says that if you're in an amenable graph, the plus state is a finite error factor of IID, um, if and only if it's equal to the minus state. Okay, so, so ba basically um, nowadays that's already known to be uh, if and only if that is at most the critical. Um, value of beta. Okay, so uh, below beta c, it's, it is a finite error factor of IID, and above beta c, it's not. Okay, so in particular, uh, once, once we assume that we're on uh, a, an interesting graph which has a phase transition, so a non one dimensional graph, uh, for large values of beta, we, we get that this is not a finite error factor of IID. Okay, on the other hand, um, we show that on non-amenable graphs for large values of beta, this is a finite error factor of IID. Um, and, and, and this gives a, a further characterization of amenability. All right, so, so those are the results I, I wanted to uh, tell you about. Um, when did we start? Did we start at two? Oh, at four? We started at two um, in UBC time. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I have like 10 more minutes or something? Yeah. Yeah. 10 more okay. minutes. All right. Okay. So, let me, let me try to tell you guys a bit about um, some of the proof ideas. Um, Okay, so I'm not, I don't want to talk about all the eight, as I said, all the eight uh, scenarios. Uh, so let's try to knock some of these off of the list. So um, first of all, for the two models, percolation and, and the easing model, let me just um, remove percol the percolation model from consideration and just tell you ahead of time that almost everything is similar to the easing model, to, to the, the arguments and and the, the, the ideas for the easing model, but they're actually technically harder because there's no FKG. Um, rem remember, we're not looking at the actual Bernoulli percolation, we're looking at the infinite clusters. And that thing does not have, is not monotone, so it doesn't have FKG, and it doesn't have a Markov property, and these things make, make everything a bit more, um, more difficult and technical. But, but in terms of the main ideas, we don't lose much by just by focusing on the easing model. Okay, so, so that knocks off half of these. So, so there's just four left. 
Let me also uh, quickly say something about the amenable case. So we already saw some arguments. We saw that um, in the percolation case that, uh, that omega infinity doesn't dominate any IAD process. And that was basically just the volume to boundary consideration. And a, a very similar argument works for the easy model to, to say that um, as beta goes to infinity, that the density of, the, of an IAD process that you dominate has to go to zero as well. And related ideas also show that you can't compare to easy models on amenable graphs. Okay, uh, so for the finitary factors on, in the amenable graph, there's still the question of why is it a finitary factor when the measures are equal and why is it not when they're unequal? Um, I, I think I, I won't say too much about this, uh, just that uh, when they're equal, this, this is a construction that uses coupling from the past. So again, this is due to Van Berg and Steiff. Um, and, and, and the second result is, is also due to them. And, and basically what, what, what the result what the argument goes like is something like this. There's an abstract general argument to say that any finitary factor of IED, uh, this is unrelated to the easy model, just anything that you can write as a finitary factor of IED, um, it, it's going to have, a, it's, it's gonna satisfy the ergodic theorem with an exponential rate of convergence in, in the volume. So if you look at something like the probability that the average in a big box is a smaller um, than what it should be by some epsilon, that, that's gonna have an exponentially small probability in the volume. Uh, but then if for the easing model, just using finite energy, the probability that the average is less than minus n, so, by, so there's, there's a symmetry here and finite energy, you can switch from plus to minus boundary conditions at a cost which is this exponential in the boundary. And then basically you see the other measure, the, the, the inverted measure. Uh, so that has, that's lower bounded by something exponential on the boundary. But if you're above the critical point, then, then this M is positive, there's positive magnetization and, and, and this is a contradiction if M is positive, these, these two things can't go together. Okay, but you see that this really uses amenability. The, the contradiction is the fact that the boundary is much smaller than the volume. Okay, so what that leaves us is um, just the easing model and the non-immutable case. Okay, and the results on stochastic domination and the results on finitary coding. So there were two results on stochastic domination and one result about finitary codings. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Uh, how do you show that easing dominates an IID process? A high density one as beta goes to infinity. Okay, so one thing that you might try to do to uh, this is, this is basically a standard way to show that a, a process dominates IID. You look at a value of P such that you can guarantee that the probability that XV is one conditionally on everything else is always, almost surely at least P. If you know that, then just by doing a sequential coupling, you can, you can, you can couple X with an IID process of, of density P uh, so that it dominates it. Okay, so you get that um, the optimal density that you dominate is at least this, uh, this value here. Okay, so what happens for the easy model if we want to apply this inequality? Well, the, this P star is actually easy to compute in the easy model. This is what happens when a vertex is surrounded by minuses. So the easy model is a Markov random field. So we just, have, we just need the neighbors to, to be minuses. And in that case, you can compute the probability to be a plus and to one over e to the two beta times the degree plus one. And while this is positive, it goes to zero as that goes to infinity. Okay, so this, this method isn't going to allow us to, to, to show that, um, that we dominate a high density for, uh, IID process. Okay, we're gonna have to do something else. And the key idea basically is to take our easy configuration and apply an independent dilution to it to obtain a new configuration tau, which is smaller. Okay, so we, we keep the minuses as is, but every plus that we see in the easing configuration, we're gonna flip it to a minus with probability one minus Q. So with probability Q, we keep it, and with probability one minus Q, we flip it to a minus. Okay, so we made our, we made sigma into a smaller, we obtained a smaller process tau from that. Okay, so definitely sigma, 
uh, dominates tau, and, and therefore p of sigma is at least p of tau. Now, for tau, we apply this general um, th this general um, method that we said above to say that it's at least p star of tau. And now we can hope to lower bound p star of tau. Perhaps we can hope that this uh, this dilution gave us some room and, and made the, the p star value much larger. Now, the distribution of tau is actually not easy to, to describe. Um, it's, it's no longer a Markov random field, for example. It, it's not finite range anymore uh, because of this dilution. But you can relate it back to the sigma because it's, it's an it's a independent dilution of the sigma. So actually, this p star is at least q, which was the probability to keep a plus, times p star sigma given tau, which I haven't defined, but it's basically the same definition where this is x with respect to x, but you can write x with respect to some other process here that you condition on. So this is basically, what is the smallest probability that sigma v is a one conditionally on tau? And if we can lower bound that, then we're good. And this thing, sigma given tau is actually something that we can understand. Um, if you, you just write down the, the, some computations and you see that, that actually this is an exactly an easy model with some plus boundary conditions in the places where tau is a plus. But the places where tau is a minus, you have a negative magnetic field, which is, whose value is one half log of one minus q. So this introduces a negative magnetic field, which is going to make the, it's gonna make a, a vertex more likely to be minus. But as it turns out on the non-amenable graph, if you have a small magnetic field, if the temperature is sufficiently low, that, that small magnetic field doesn't have a very large effect because the boundary effect is, is larger. So, so this is basically a Pyre's argument um, where you, you use this non-amenability to, um, to, 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 to show that you still have a good bound and, and, and this P star of sigma given tau. So even in the presence of a negative magnetic field, if beta is sufficiently large, um, you, you basically don't feel that, that, that effect. Okay, so that, 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 that's the idea here. Um, now for the easing dominating and easing, um, very, like at a very high level, we wanna do the same thing. Uh, so the analog of this P star, which was comparing X to an IID process, if you have two processes now, X and Y, there's something called Hawley's criterion, which tells you that if the probability of X being a one, given some boundary condition is at least that for y, for any boundary condition which is larger for x than for y. I'm, I'm, I'm removing some technicalities here, but basically that tells you that x um, stochastically dominates y. Um, there's, there's some nice proofs via a Markov chains for that. Okay, but now we encounter very similar problem to before. We can't actually apply this to, to compare two easing models uh, where better one and better two are close to each other, basically for the exact same reason, the exact same computation, this function is decre decreases with beta. So therefore, actually, if a vertex is surrounded by all minus, if this x is all minus and y is all minus, then the probability on the left is actually smaller than the probability on the right. Okay, so we don't have this Hawley domination, but, but as I said, we want to, at a very high level, do what we did before. We wanna take our sigma and dilute it somehow to get a tau. And then we hope that this tau, we can apply this, uh, this Hawley criterion to in order to dominate the, uh, the, the other easing model. Um, the, the problem here is that if we just do an independent dilution to the sigma, uh, this actually fails. Uh, so, so there's a, a small computation to, to do to, to check that it actually can't work, but, but it doesn't work. And you need a more sophisticated mechanism. And, and what we use is a mechanism based on, on lattice gas theory. Uh, so very briefly, this is related to the hardcore model and complex zeros, which, which, which th these are things that we encounter today already and cluster expansions and, and even the Lovech local lemma. And this goes all the way back to, to Shearer in, in the 80s and De Bruchin and, and more recently Scott and Sokol made this, uh, this connection, uh, elucidated a lot, of, a lot of these connections. So just to give you a flavor of what's going on here, uh, here's a problem that you can, um, <clears throat> that, that, that's seemingly unrelated, but, but it, it's very closely related. Can you construct a random independent set in some graph 
<clears throat> so that whenever you take a set of vertices which which are which form an independence of themselves, the probability that all of those are in your independent set is exactly p to the n. In other words, if you have if you take some some vertices which aren't adjacent to each other, you want the event that that vertex is in your independent set, that one is in this independent set and so forth, you want those events to be independent of each other. Yeah, so there's two, two, um, two ways that I'm using the word independent here. I hope it's not, I hope that's clear. An independent set is a set which doesn't contain any two adjacent vertices. And then there's the probabilistic independence. Okay, so the answer to this is going to depend on the graph and on the value of P. Um, but as it turns out, there's a, a sufficient condition and, and this isn't the best sufficient condition. I just wrote this here. So, so for those who are familiar with the Lovich local lemma, maybe this, this reminds you of, of uh, the condition in the Lovich local lemma. So, so there's some close relations between these types of questions. And how is this related to what uh, we want to do? So the dilution mechanism that we want to do is basically a construction like this, where the graph that we apply it to is not the base graph that we're working on, but we have an auxiliary graph, which is the graph of clusters. So we, we take our graph, say z squared. Well, okay, we're on a non immutable graph, but we take our graph and every finite connected set is now going to be a vertex of this auxiliary graph. Okay, and there's going to be an, um, an edge between two of those if they're at distance at most one. So either the intersect or they're adjacent. And to that graph, we want to apply a construction like this of, of independent sets. And we're not gonna use the same value P for every vertex, but every vertex now corresponds to a cluster and different clusters are gonna have different weights according to their size and their, their geometry. Um, and and if, if, if all of this is chosen uh, very carefully, um, and, and, that, and that process is used to dilute the sigma, then you can get a tau which you can actually prove that it, it, it dominates the, the, the second easing model in the sense of, of, of Holly. Okay, so I, I, think I, I, I think I'll skip over the, the finite area factor result here. Uh, that we, we have some general results um, about finite area factors, uh, which together with the uh, results about the stochastic domination allow us to obtain um, the result about the easing model. Um, but I, I think I'll skip that. Um, yeah, and let me just say that there's a lot of open problems here. As I said, every pretty much every theorem I, I, I introduced, there's um, there are open problems, and 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 most of them are basically extending the questions uh, in the non-amenable case down to um, to, to near criticality. Um, and, and as it turns out, all of these questions, we, we basically don't even know on trees. So um, yeah, so this first question here, we know on a tree, but for example, on a tree, we don't know if the infinite clusters invariantly dominate IID. Uh, we don't know if, um, in, in the easing model, if, uh, if if there's actually a difference between mu plus and mu minus in terms of the the easing the the IID processes they dominate, and uh, for the finite area factors, a similar situation. Uh, even on a tree, we don't know the, the, these answers, which which is somewhat surprising. Um, okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, so there are questions for Ina. I can't relay them to so through this microphone, but you can't hear most of you. <laughs> or I can just bring the microphone to you. That might be the easiest way. Okay. Well, I, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Thanks. Um, can you say a few words about what you have to do extra to get equivariant couplings? Yeah. Um, so uh, for the invariant couplings, um, that okay. So let's talk about um, just dominating IIDs invariantly. So so this this um this this quantity here p star. Um, you might expect that um, 
that I can add here, um, that I can say that the p inv is at least p star. In other words, that if we have this very strong domination, then, um, then our process invariantly dominates IAD. And we know this almost completely with some technical um, caveats, but, but that's basically uh, the way we go. And, and, and up to some technical caveats, what you do is, is you can do a Glauber dynamics. Okay, so you have your, uh, your process X and you have an IAD process of a parameter P for some P which, which satisfies this, uh, this thing here. And, and you want to get, construct an invariant coupling. So what you can do is you can run Glauber dynamics on the infinite graph in an invariant way. So uh, you, can, you can do this in continuous time, for example, or, or in discrete time. Um, and, and, and that definition is invariant. So once you know that that's well-defined, that that dynamics is well-defined, you're going to get an invariant coupling. Okay, so every time you update a vertex, uh, you, for the X process, you want to update it according to its conditional distributions. And for the other process, you just want to put a Bernoulli p rem variable. And this condition tells you that you can update those both simultaneously in such a way that the X value is greater or equal than the Bernoulli value. Okay, so that's going to give you an invariant coupling if that, that process that I described actually makes sense. And, and that's kind of a technicality of whether you can even do uh, Glauber dynamics in infinite volumes for um, abstract processes. Uh, but, but, you know, for nice processes, you can do this. For the easing model, you can definitely do it. Uh, however, um, for, the re for our results, we don't actually apply it to the easing model because as I said, we do this dilution first. So we get a model which is not a nearest neighbor model. So, so we do need some generality, but, but that, that's the way that we, that we approach it. It's this, this Glauber dynamics. Okay, thanks. Um, there are uh, any other um, questions? Oh. I was wondering about uh, the, your theorem where you have that the, so the best the best percolation that it, on an amiable graph that the plus state dominates as you send yeah. the temperature to infinity that goes to zero, the probability goes to zero. Does it actually get worse as the temperature goes to infinity? Or is it just hard to say what happens at finite temperature? Uh, okay, so uh, you're talking about the easing model on an amenable graph, right? Yeah, that one in the amenable case. Yeah. Okay, so uh, okay, so just to make just to correct something, uh, as beta goes to infinity, so the temperature is going to zero. Oh right, sorry. Right? Yeah. Okay, so we know that we know that it's going to zero. Um, are you asking if it's like if it's decreasing monotonically or? Yeah, I guess maybe I'm thinking about it wrong, but it seems sort of counterintuitive that it would be worse for. Uh, I, yes, I, I know, I know that that's that's kind of the issue that because in in terms of but the it, picture, in terms, okay. yeah, yeah. So in in terms of of the density of pluses is definitely increasing as beta is increasing, right? You're getting so in that sense, you're getting more and more pluses, but the issue is that with some small probability, which is not too small, it's just, it's, it's, it's just small um, in terms of the boundary. So with probability, which is exponentially small in the boundary, you can also get a lot more minuses because you can switch from the plus measure to the minus measure at a cost which is just exponential in the boundary. Um, and and that, that, that makes, it, make, makes it problematic for dominating an IAD process, right? Because if, if you wanna dominate, um, um, an IID process, you want the probability to, so for example, if you dominate a 99% um, IID process, or even a 10% IID process, it means that the probability of, um, of having 95% uh, zeros should be exponentially small in the volume because that's that the IID process has that property and you dominate it. Uh, but the easing model doesn't have that property because having 95% minuses is, is, is hard, but it's not exponentially hard in the volume. It's only exponentially hard in the, in the boundary. So that's the issue. Thanks. Um, so other, other questions? Um, can you 
also say things about like pots models or like randomly coloring a, another random cluster model with a different parameter? Right. So, so um, I would say yes. Um, we decided not to include any of this because uh, the, the paper was long to begin with, but I, I would say that um, the results for the easing model, um, so uh, the, the result for the easing models, yeah, this should go through to the POTS model. Um, but the result for the, the result for Bernoulli percolation, so you might ask this about uh, the random cluster model. Um, I, I expect a lot of this to go through, okay, for, but, but, not, but perhaps with some caveat. So if, if you go back to this, uh, this example, where we took a Bernoulli percolation, we colored things uh, independently. So if you, if you start with a random cluster model with, uh, with say, Q equals two, and you do this, Right. Uh, if you, if, depending on if you start with the free or the wired, basically you get the the easing model. And so you might expect that if you know something for the easing model, maybe you can you, maybe you can uh, prove something for the FK. Uh, the thing is that the infinite clusters uh, for the FK are like like showing that omega infinity itself is a finite area factor of ID. That that you can't you can't extract that from something about the easing model. Um, so, so that really is stronger, but I do expect that some of these things go through, but, but, but these things are delicate. As I said, the, even the results for Bernoulli percolation are more technical than the results for easing. So, so then the random cluster model, things are similar in some senses, in some senses different. Um, I expect some things to go through, but I, I, I don't know exactly what. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank Enan again. Thanks, Enan. Thanks. Um, guess that's it for today. Um,